throughout the whole of my life, one thing that's come through as being really true and really valuable is being in control of the food that you grow. Actually having a, a say in your own nutrition because I've been brought up by my family to believe that uh, our primary health service is the food that we grow. Doctors and nurses are lovely for breaking, uh, mending things when they're broken, but they're not our primary health service. It's, it's what we eat and the way in which we, we, we live our lives that gra greatly add to our, uh, our character. And look, um, I've always had this belief in being honest to people, whether that makes people like me or not, I decided many years ago when I was 17 and I went to Kew Gardens, I was completely in a, uh, a very adult and a very male world and I'd just come out with the idea that I had to be gay and I thought I'd tell people I am gay and the first opportunity came when we were doing public lectures. Uh, they video recorded uh, a talk, we could talk about anything, sex, politics and religion but not to do with gardening so I thought fine, I'll come out. So I came out in the Jodrell Laboratory on video with 500 people from the Kew Mutual Improvement Society. So I had retired botanic, garden, retired botanic gardeners and all sorts of research botanists and blah, 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 all there. And they wondered what the hell this guy was talking about. Um, I won their, their, their solidity, their sort of support, their solidarity. Um, and I thought the reason I did it was I'm going to be with these guys for a long time and I'd rather they dislike me for who I really am rather than to like me for something that I'm not actually, you know. And Jerry on TV is partly what I am but it's not really me. So it's nice if you watch the show and you like me but it's important that you recognise the fact that I've got a certain package of skills which you can't get in Australia and I've transported those over here. And so when I tell you things about um, global warming, um, I, I sometimes I tread on people's toes. I, I was the first person to break the consequences of global warming for Australian gardeners in 2004 on television. You know, and there was a huge outcry um, by the denialists at the time that, that anything like that could possibly be true, that we couldn't accurately forecast things to the way in which we, we can today, almost 10 years on. And it was the same attitude then. I thought people deserved to know about the way in which things were going at that time because it gave people a chance to, to change the way they lived, change the way they garden and to do better. So that was, that was my objective then. Now look, I, uh, I found myself... <laughs> I, found, I found myself invited by Santina to talk about cornerstone plants. Now, talking about anything to a group of hardcore gardeners like you is going to be difficult, okay? I'm not lecturing school kids. I'm not lecturing rank amateurs, I'm talking to my peers. And so really what I'd like to do is to spark conversation and hear other people say what they're saying. That's why I love the way you said that everybody's got a voice here because this is not Jerry talking to people for entertainment. I'm hoping you might actually give me something that I don't know as well. You know, this is how gardening goes, okay? So I'll bring you up to speed where my world is at the moment. I set up a sustainable house and garden in Brisbane nearly 10 years ago with the objective of showing ordinary people how they could change their lives and the way they could grow food, adapt food to a changing climate and live comfortably but on a very low budget. The, I mean that's my reality, okay? I, I work for the ABC 30 days a year. Uh, everything else like paying a mortgage and everything, I have to do all those other things. There's no glamour working with the ABC. Um, it's harsh reality, particularly when there's a household of three and two people are not working full time. Okay, So uh, we're not doing it particularly uh, lavishly. But that's been the reality of my life for, for nearly 10 years. That came about because I created 
the Rare and Threatened Plants Garden at Sydney Botanic Gardens, and that project started in 1995. Now, when I started that project, there was um, a book that came out prior to the Global Environment Outlook, Geo4. This is my current Bible. Um, prior to that, there was, there was an earlier version, and there was one copy in the whole of the Royal Botanic Gardens of the earlier version of this. And um, I had to go and buy one because everybody wanted to read it. This is the last word on uh, peer-reviewed research into our food security future. I mean, if you want to learn about cornerstone plants and the services that they provide, this gives you a global perspective as well as a very specific Australian perspective. And this is about the best that there is. So that, that, that formed the Rare and Threatened Plants Garden, which was opened in the Botanic Gardens back in 98. And yet I feel that I have been completely caught um, this morning I, I found myself writing because in the consequence the update of GO4 is so concerning. The only way I can explain this to my peers is that I feel we have now left the carbon dioxide global warming era and we've now stepped into the methane gas global warming era. And thank God there are a few heads shaking here in agreement with me because I just feel like, you know, this is like the realisation that I am not going to get married and have children when I was 15. You know, it's like bloody hell. Just when I thought the future was organised and for the last 15 years there was a basic consensus about how we could turn things around and lessen the impact of global warming, the rug has been pulled away. And um, so, look, I now find myself in the, a position, and this is what I'm putting to you, my position is exactly the same as the position of the people that deny climate change. My position is we need to go for business as usual because there's not a single thing that would have made things easier had we adopted them that I've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. Carbon sequestration in the soil, protecting old growth forests, securing national parks, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Nothing is any different, it's just that the urgency is even greater. And so if you can step away from the horror of this realisation of what this new edge is, this, this new era is that we've edged into, if you can get away from that and you can just think of all of these little things that we've been doing as umbrellas, oh sorry, umbrellas, <laughs> I did mean parachutes, you know, with the, with, with the idea that society, humanity has leapt out of the plane. We're going to hit the ground at some stage, but wouldn't it be lovely if there was a little parachute just to soften the blow, yeah? And that's what all these ideas, you know, renewable energy, you name it, all of these are lovely little ideas and one of the most powerful ways of, of, of achieving beneficial outcomes is diversity. As a gardener, diversity in what you grow will guarantee that whatever nature throws at you, something will get through and there will always be food on the table. You know, diversity in attempts at solving these problems. Don't just go for one thing. You know, big problems tend to bring big, uh, big problems tend to encourage big solutions. You know, we like to build big dams, we like to have grand projects that solve everything in one go. It's much better to have a diversity of them. And so if something further down the track that we started a few years ago seems to be a better way to go, then it's already on stream, it's already on tap. You know, just as a managing strategy, diversity in ways of getting through is one of the things I would love to leave you thinking is still as valid now as it was 15 years ago. Now, having come out, so to speak, with my, my sort of realisation that methane is now the big thing, um, I'm supposed to be talking about cornerstone plants. We're very good as a species about putting fences around national parks and occasionally securing 
things because of their intrinsic value rather than what assets they may offer. We're quite good at that. And we tend to look at the world in plan form, a satellite view or a planner's view. In, an, in a warming world, it's important to look at topography as well. Because if things are warming, then things that need cool climates are going to be migrating. Things are going to be migrating south. Warm fish, warm water fish are now down in Tasmanian waters. They've already made the move. They don't need reminders. They don't need adverts. You know, that's where they now live. Um, so when we, we have this idea of national parks, we have this idea of planted corridors between national parks and conservation areas. Don't just think linear, think of the topography, allow things to breathe, allow things to move. This flexibility is absolutely key when you're living in an area like we are here. In the subtropics we have such a diversity of plants and that is because, not just because of the soils, it's not just because of the climate, it's because of the landform as much as anything else. So we have to think in terms of that. And also we need to think in terms of spread. So when you're looking at the value of something, say native trees, say you're looking at the Myrtaceae family, the uh, Melaleucas and the Eucalypts, absolutely iconic Australian trees. Um, if you were to look at cornerstone plants, you would look at that family first because so much diversity, it's not just the spread, it's not just the scale of their numbers, it's the diversity of things from bacteria, lichen, fungi, animals that live in and around the communities they produce, as well as the individuals, they stand out as cornerstone plants in my mind. And when you look at those, you then see the vulnerabilities. The genus Eucalyptus has over 700 species very few of those species occur out of an area that with a two degrees C difference. So they're quite temperature limited, diverse and adapted very well to the environments and the habitats that they exist in, but they don't spread very far with a few exceptions. And this is where you sort of, when you're sifting through Myrtaceae, absolutely essential for biodiversity and of course all the traditional uses that these plants have, medicines and food and shelter and construction, whatever, all of these things are there. But if you sift through those, and I had to say I would throw out two cornerstone plants out of those families, it would be the Kajaput, Melaleuca leucodendron, and the forest red gum, Eucalyptus teretocornis. I would offer those to you as two of the most significant habitat trees that we have on the east coast of Australia. Melaleuca leucodendron, you'll find that in New Caledonia, Papua New Guinea, right the way from Thursday Island all the way down to the south coast of New South Wales. That's one hell of a gene pool. And uh, Eucalyptus teretocornis, you'll find that in Papua New Guinea as well. And that will occur right the way down the east coast not quite so widespread, but it'll be right the way down the east coast, down to northeastern Victoria. Again, a massive gene pool within that. And I'd throw to you a heresy. Up until now, when we're talking about revegetation um, or regeneration, we've gone for local gene pools. Now, if the equator is currently expanding at one kilometer a year, so the tropics are moving south, you know, the landscape is on the move. This is where you get this idea of green corridors have to take in topography. Topography is so important. And also spread, you're allowing things to spread. So look, if I was revegetating in Brisbane today, I'd be looking at Eucalyptus tree to cornice and Melaleuca leucodendron from somewhere like Townsville, which is right on the edge of the subtropics and the tropics. Bring those genes down because if there's a slight adaptation to slightly more extreme conditions, they're going to have it. They're going to have it. Not local genes. I wouldn't do that anymore. Wouldn't go for that anymore. But I'm quite happy for people to argue the toss. 
because this is this is the way I'm, I'm, I'm having to think now because I'm looking I'm re-identifying at all these little parachutes that I've got in my mind for the last 15 years what can give us the cutting edge what can give us the cutting edge you see because if we have more than two degrees of warming we've lost flying foxes you know and they were providing the pollination services between national parks so they were a really useful independent regulatory organization you know of seeding and seed dispersal pollination bugger what the humans are doing we can fly from one place to another well that's gone with more than two degrees of warming so it's got to be what can we do well if you're regenerating look north because our gardens are on the move in a way that they've never done so before that's the only way i can do it but you know it's going to be faster than it used to be Resilience is, is one of those words that people are going to get fed up with, like sustainability and organic and eco, you know, but resilience really is going to be one of those things. When I started gardening, um, one of the first decent crops I grew was, was potatoes. And uh, I've grown them in, in London, in Edinburgh, Paris, Perth in Western Australia, down in Sydney, and I've now grown them in Brisbane. I've lost four crops in the whole of my life and they were all in Brisbane. Three of them were to flooding rain in the middle of the dry season and one crop was due to drought in the middle of the wet season. Yeah? So something that I relied on, something I took for granted, I mean potato growing for God's sake, you stick them in the ground and they grow. You know it's one of those old tricks, you put them in rough ground to break the soil and make it easier for the gardener. And here I am up in Brisbane, a total failure with potatoes. And this is where resilience comes in and diversity. I don't grow potatoes much now unless the weather's really good. You know, I've ceased to be a gardener that has a, a regular rhythm to my gardening. I mean, don't get me wrong, autumn is when I do soil preparation for winter and spring is when I do the soil preparation for summer, you know. that. But those things will, will always carry on. There's always going to be a cooler and a warmer part of the year. But now I'm, I, I'm much more reactive. I don't put poultry manure out unless I can see the rain coming on the radar. Um, now my part of the world, Brisbane, is not that far away, but horticulturally we are miles apart. You know, I mean, there is no guarantee up there. No guarantee at all. And I like it. I like it. And it sounds masochistic, but I like the fact that you cannot guarantee what's going to happen. But I love the fact that no season ever repeats because you're always being challenged. You're always having to be alert. You're always on the ball. You're always checking what goes right and why. If you keep a note, it really helps. That part of the woods is a really challenging place to put food on the table. And I think I said to you, Santina, um, that I, I, I have this formula. My granddad gave me a formula. World, uh, World War II, dig for victory campaign. Um, they had a formula that uh, 100 square meters of soil could provide most of the food, fruit, vegetables, herbs, and spices that an adult needed for a year. Now, if you can do that in a miserable climate like England, you should be able to do really well down here in Brisbane, and you can. I, I've been able to do it, but you need to modify it. And this is, this is what getting used to using cornerstone plants is about. You've got to adapt. I now say 100 square metres per person will provide 70% of the fresh fruit, vegetables, herbs and spices that an adult needs in a year. You can do that, and you can do that whether you're in prolonged drought or in flooding rain because I've been doing it for nine years in Brisbane. What you need to modify it with is each hundred square meters needs 10,000 litres minimum of stored water just in case you ha have to rely on bucket watering. That's the, that's, that's the formula. I've only got seven, 7,000 litres per hundred square meters and I can still do it but life is a bit boring and you have to do a little bit more work, you know, and that's the thing, you simplify the food you grow. So these things are, are changing, 
and we need to look at new ways of doing things. I think this is this is the key thing. I'm I, I'm convinced that uh, we're going to see some dramatic change, and I think the most profound change we're going to see is amongst ourselves. When I look around you, uh, I mean, we we are hardcore gardeners. <laughs> who, who else would be here in a tent? <laughs> In these yeah, conditions, you know. Tell us, tell us what, tell, tell the people here what we have instead of potatoes these days. You need to talk. <coughs> about that I, I, well, look, I mean, it's it's all around me. Sorry. Look, I I grow green pawpaw, and I eat more green pawpaw than I do ripe pawpaw. You know, it's much more nutritious than most people believe. You know, it is a very nutritious vegetable to grow, but it's more useful as a green pawpaw. Um, I grow yams. I grow two types. The winged yam, where you can get a, a yam root about 35 kilos in a good year. This is a good year, it'd be a good harvest. And aerial potatoes, which grow about that sort of size. And they take, don't take any skill at all to grow. Um, I grow corn, and this is a cornerstone plant. Okay. Oh, okay, look, I just, I don't want to clutter the place up, but look, um, I grow corn. This is, this is just uh, one I kept for display purposes. The, um, the good one, this is, this is grown by Bega Valley Seed Savers. There's one guy who's been conserving Manning Pride corn for 30 years. This is a keystone plant. Corn is probably one of the most versatile crops that we have on earth. I mean the Americans, I take my hat off to them occasionally and in the case of corn their knowledge of what you can do with a cob of corn is unparalleled on earth you know they use it for almost anything um, but look with this Manning Pride this is a very this is a very small cob normally they're about a foot long 30 centimeters long you get about two or three cobs on a plant and as a result, you can get about 35 to 40 kilos of corn from a 10 square meter plot. That's one of the things I do in my garden. I try and work out what you can get from 10 square meters because home gardeners, which are basically my audience, not you guys, um, the average gardener, they, anything bigger than 10 square meters is, is a bit challenging for beginner gardeners. You know, they can get their head around it. But if you want to, if you want to double or triple your corn crop, the 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 the, the consequence of going from uh, a super sweet corn to Manning Pride is a lot more chewing, a lot more sustaining starch in this. This one of these, if you can eat two, you'll feel stuffed. You know this sustaining stuff, and you can go out and you can dig all morning on two cobs of Manning Pride. But you can't do that with super sweet. But if you want to increase productivity. You don't always have to look at hybrids. You don't always have to look at modified modern crops. You can look at some of the traditional ones like Australian produced Manning Pride. Now the skills that go into producing Manning Pride, those are skills that are worth conserving. Yeah? You know, they, they've always been valuable, but to find somebody that can do this, they are really worthwhile keeping. That's a keystone. That's a keystone plant for you. Um, apart from corn and yams, I grow um, cocoa yams, um, Xanthosoma sagittifolia, elephant's ear, it's like a, a taro, but it produces um, roots which are about that, stems are about that high and about that much in the soil. And uh, they're about as thick as my thigh, so you know, you can feed a lot of people from cocoa yams, and they, they don't mind drought. So when the rain is switched off, you can still get a good crop from cocoa yams when I'm struggling with taro. And I've given up with taro in Brisbane. We just don't get it wet enough, long enough, to be able to produce a, a decent crop of taro, you know? Um, and um, arrowroot is, is, is one of the other standbys. And this, look, this is something which home gardeners don't like because you, you have to do a bit of preparation of arrowroot 
you've got to modify, you've got to practice how you cook with them and they find arrowroot just a little bit too much, you know, I mean, you just slice up the, the roots very thinly, you leach them in water for 12 hours and then you boil them and use them and I don't find that too much of a difficulty because I can soak beans before I cook them, you know, I mean, this is the way I was brought up. Some people it's a barrier. Um, another thing is, is, is bananas. That, that's, a, that's a cornerstone crop. You know, if our climate is getting wetter, in certain areas, oh no, these are, these are windfall. I just thought I'd bring some Java blue bananas along because kids love the fact that bananas don't always have to be yellow. They, 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 this, this, this is a, you know, marketing, yeah? If you want to get kids engaged, in, 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 in gardening, they love, jar they love blue bananas, they love trigona bees, the stingless bees, because they always assume that bees sting. They get absolutely hooked on the idea of feeding poultry. Uh, this is beginners. I mean, again, I'm not really talking to you as an audience. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you as peers, but the kids just get blown away by feeding grubs to chickens. They also love the idea that guinea pigs can be used as lawn mowers. Um, you know, and, and the idea of growing your own food with your own sewage is something that kids love. You know, I was one of the, I've got about four, from a group of 30 kids, I've got about four pictures of my sewage system out of it. You know, that's, it's inspiring to know that the next generation won't regard sewage as a problem, you know, particularly when we hit peak phosphorus around about 2030, you know, it's going to be really handy having access to sewage. But anyway, the, the banana thing, again, it's uh, amateur gardeners and amateur cooks really hate green bananas because you've got to cook them before you can actually produce anything out of them. I, I, I found the easiest way to overcome that barrier is to do a little bit of advertising for Planet Arc. They do a citrus uh, laundry stain remover and that's really good for getting the scum from boiling green bananas off saucepans. Uh, if you use other types of cleaners, it's, you know, all, all the earth friendly, planet friendly sort of stuff, they turn it into chewing gum and it just moves around the pot. But um, this Planet Arc laundry stain remover is a really good way of overcoming the barrier. But look, bananas, absolutely key cornerstone plant. We, we, we love eating them ripe, but they also have an equally valuable role in this part of the world where the weather is getting warmer and wetter. You see, the, the thing is not so much warming that is a, is a concern, it's the warming of the soil and the, the changing nature of fungi that we have to deal with that concerns me. I'm really concerned about fungal diseases, things like Pythium and Rhizoctonia, um, Verticillium wilt, all those, all those sorts of things. They go from being passive to being really aggressive as the soil warms up. And this is the area that brings us here today. Because I mean, this is about living soil and living futures. It's actually, this is, this is the great challenge for gardeners, is maintaining healthy soil in a warming world. A meter down below us, that soil temperature never changes. It's permanent. In Brisbane, a meter down, it's 16.2 degrees. Down in Bri uh, Sydney, at Sydney Botanic Gardens, um, it's 13 degrees, I think it was 13.1, which is why when you stick a tulip in the ground down there it jumps out the ground, you know? You have to put them a foot down in order to fake a reasonably good tulip display for about a fortnight if it's not too sunny, you know, and they bleach. So look, fungi, maintaining healthy soil. You've been to a workshop on composting, this is, this is the key. The key really is in the soil and how we look after it. Because everything above ground that we grow is much more resilient to changing fortunes than underneath the ground. 
the roots are the most vulnerable part of a plant and the most damaging thing that can occur is for a crop to be exposed to warmer soil than it's used to. I can grow fantastic turnips in Brisbane, better than I could grow them in England in Brisbane's winter. I can grow button mushrooms, half a kilo. I had, I had portobello mushrooms the size of my face last year. Dead easy to grow them when it's slightly warmer, but as soon as it gets a little bit warmer, then the fungus uh, flies kill the mushrooms, root rots get into the turnips. You know, things change, your fortunes change very, very quickly. You've got to be opportunistic on what you grow, but you've got to look after that soil. My soil has got me through the last three flooding years with no loss of crops. I've lost nothing, nothing at all. And all I've done is I've raised my garden beds and I put organic soil in there. And I've maintained that by putting compost every time I take a crop out, I put compost in. I mulch everything. There's no bare soil in my garden. Potters, wasps, potter wasps have to go to other gardens to get the soil they need. They find no, no respite in my place. But that soil that breathes, and in weather like this, you can see when the rain comes, it soaks it up, swells, and you can see a film of moisture on the top of the soil. And then the rain eases a little bit and it breathes again, and it all flows through. I get no runoff. I can get 85 mil of rain falling in 20 minutes and no runoff from my property. We recorded this. Looking after the soil is one of the key ways of keeping your plants healthy, one of the key ways of looking after the good fungi, the beneficial things that live in the soil that help to defend your plants for them. They, these things like mycorrhizal fungi, these will be the key for survival in a warming world. These will be the key achieving that balance. So look, I'm not going to go over what you've already heard for that last, that last talk, but this is as far as my thoughts have gone. Diversity in what you grow, being selective about the sort of key habitat trees that you, 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 you plant, looking north to warmer climates for revegetation and planting. If you're planting for legacy, look north. Be flexible. Don't have a fixed rule for when you must do this or when you must do that. Be seasonal, but respond to the wet. Plant in wet weather, sow in dry weather. If you've got very little water, wait until the soil is wet before you sow a crop of corn. You know, Be flexible, be responsive to changing conditions. And above all, treat your garden like a worm farm. That's that's what makes my place work. It's got me through five years of prolonged drought. I've been able to grow food with less than one litre of water per square metre a day in hot, dry, windy weather on the shores of Moreton Bay. And I hardly ever get any run runoff. And it's all courtesy of treating my parcel of land as a worm farm.